So now that we have a sense of defining families and of um, uh, thinking about um, uh, how people form families, let's look at the institutional and interpersonal changes of family life. And so this means looking at things like how families divide up housework, what are cha uh, challenges um, that uh, parents from different socioeconomic and racial backgrounds and ethnic backgrounds experience within their families, what does intimate partner violence look like and under what conditions does it occur? And how have the social norms of families and in particular the social norms of divorce changed over time? And you know, this is sort of thinking about how a changing landscape is associated with many of the different things that we discussed in the previous two lectures. Now, in the 1980s, Arlie Russell Hochschild wrote what has become a kind of classic in the social science literature. And that classic um, is a book she called The Second Shift. And The Second Shift, um, Hochschild was pointing to uh, how household labor was divided. So many before Hochschild had talked about the division of labor, the division of different tasks within the formal labor market. But, you know, Male scholars in particular had been really, really blind to the household as a place where labor happens or to the household as a place where people do work, work that's typically not compensated, but still work that's really important. And part of the reason why these male scholars were blind to this was because many of them didn't actually do that work and somebody else did it for them. And so they didn't really pay much of attention to it. But the household is a place where a lot of work gets done, um, a lot of work that's absolutely essential to the reproduction of a society. So cooking, cleaning, laundry, um, making sure that different members of the household uh, are sustaining social relationships, have what they need for the day. This is a major kind of household labor. Raising of children is perhaps the most important form of household labor. And Hochschild argued in this book, The Second Shift, that um, women perform two shifts of, of labor. Um, so as women have entered the workforce, um, they have had to do a lot more work because before they entered the workforce, they did all of the household labor. And that was their primary shift of work for the day. But after entering the workforce, women started to do their first shift, which was work in formal employment, that is work for pay. And then they came home and did a second shift of work. And that second shift was doing housework after coming home from their wage earning jobs. Um, and here we see an example of gender inequality, an example of how women are expected to do the vast majority of household labor. Um, when added up, uh, uh, Hochschild said, these household hours amounted to an extra month of work a year for working women. And this was a significant burden that resulted in their being tired more often, more likely to get sick, and could have negative labor market outcomes upon them. So this could be part of the reason why women earn less than men, which is that women have to work much more in the household a full month of work a year they're doing in addition to their paid labor market work and that that can limit their labor market opportunities because they have less labor market flexibility, they're more tired, they get sick more frequently because of it. So this has real consequences. Now, you may think, well, I mean, one of the explanations for this second shift, particularly among some economists was, well, this is just rational. It's rational that women work a second shift because given that men make more than women, um, if you have two people who are both out in the labor market and one of them is making more than the other, it makes more sense for the one who's making more to continue to work more because overall the household will have more money that way. Now, this logic has two problems with it. Um, the first is the causal directionality. So it's not clear that couples are making 
this decision where the men are making more and so the women are deciding to do more housework, it could be that the women are doing more housework, which explains why they're working less. So the causal directionality may be one. But the second is from research by Sarah Thiebaud. And um, she updated Hochschild's research and analyzed data from 18 different countries to understand the effects of men's income relative to their spouses and what that meant for how much housework they did. So Thiebaud's question was basically this, like, what if we looked at women who make more than their husbands? How much household or how much household work do they do? Um, uh, and what she found was that men who were married to women who made more than they did, did less housework. So I'll say that again. Men whose wives make more than they do, do even less housework. One way to explain this would be, well, they're just married to super type A women, women who like work super hard all of the time. But another explanation, one that I would be a little bit more receptive to, and one that table provides, is that um, men who earn less than their wives experience a deep threat to their masculinity, to cultural expectations of masculinity, that men should be breadwinners. And so the women overcompensate with housework in order to protect their husband's masculinity. And that men expect that. Um, and this sort of is you know, sort of a powerful representation of gendered forms of inequality. And it helps us see how the household is a place where gender is done by both men and women. Now, so far, we've really talked about this and many of the discussions in marriage and the family in a heterosexual context. But, um, uh, we could also look at the LGBTQ community and ask, well, what if we take gender, at least in terms of uh, uh, um, gay and lesbian couples, somewhat out of the picture. You're not taking it totally out of the picture, but you're sort of taking people who live together who are of the same gender identity. What is the consequence for their households? And so looking at lesbian and gay households, um, uh, a scholar named Kurdick looked at, and this was a qualitative study, so they just only looked at 80 couples, but still 80 couples is 80 couples. And they showed that compared with uh, heterosexual peers, households made up of two male partners or two female partners reported that their tasks were done far more equally. Overall, partners did household labor when they found it necessary and they communicated more about the kind of household work that they were doing. And this suggests that the, the household labor is driven in part by a set of gendered relations uh, within a society, and that the differential rates of household labor are an expression of gendered inequalities. And again, we should map, care about this um, in, in, in part, in no small part, because it may be one, of the many factors responsible for the gendered wage gap, um, which is gendered expectations of, of the continuation of labor within the household. Finally, I'll note that Hochschild, in her original study, also pointed out that um, the labor that women had to do in the household was typically immediate and regular, whereas the labor that men had to do in the household was often quite flexible in the time. And so women were more constrained than men. So an example of this is that like women were typically uh, responsible for doing things like cooking dinner. And cooking dinner requires that you cook dinner like for that evening for the members of the household. You can't say to your family, you know what, I'll just cook dinner tomorrow. Like let's not cook dinner tonight. Let's not have dinner. Like that is not really a feasible um, uh, 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 way of thinking about dinner in a household. Um, and by contrast, like men do things like change the oil on the car. And, you know, you should change the oil on the car every 3,000 miles. And, you know, men may do it at 2,900 miles or 3,200 miles or anywhere in between, which means that men can do their household labor often within like week spans at the time that's convenient for them. And this is another critical difference. 
In addition to household labor, um, uh, there are significant differences in parenting. And this uh, graph points to the amount of maternity leave um, that is guaranteed to women by different countries. And according to the OECD, which is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the United States is the only country of the 41 countries they studied that has no mandated parent paid leave for new parents. So parents can take some leave by law, but there's no mandate that that leave result in pay. And if you contrast this with other countries like the UK, which provides um, uh, 52 weeks potentially, up to 52 weeks of paid parenting leave, or Ireland, which has 41 weeks of paid parenting leave, or Turkey, which has 15 weeks, 16 weeks of paid parenting leave, or Japan or South Korea, which has you know, 12 or 13 weeks of paid parenting leave, the United States is a huge outlier. So of the 193 countries that the United Nations studied, the only countries without national paid leave policy were New Guinea, Suriname, and a few South Pacific Island nations and the United States. So you know, the US is a huge outlier here in that women can take legally maternity leave, but they are not required to be paid for it. Um, so, you know, in the, in the United States, the Family Medical Leave Act of 1993, which was a critical act, does require uh, people who work for at least 12 months in certain kinds of businesses um, that they be entitled to unpaid leave for medical, family, or health conditions. But, um, Basically, that only applied to 12% of American workers. So even the right to unpaid leave was highly restricted. And this has a huge impact on women's labor market uh, experiences. So if women don't have the right, in some instances, even to unpaid maternal leave, or in no instances do they have the right to paid maternal leave, then the experience of having a child is going to disproportionately fall upon women. And it pushes men typically to not engage in child rearing. Because if one partner has to leave the labor force and doesn't have any guarantee of pay for leaving that labor force, the other partner in a heterosexual relationship, the man is absolutely going to have to keep working. And so this is how gender is just not something that is a reflection of a biological reality, but instead is produced through social policies and through, produced through political institutions. And so this is why some of the gen we see the high gender wage gaps. This is part of the reason why we see the high gender wage gaps in the United States, because social policies literally produce gendered practices and gendered outcomes. Um, in addition, you know, um, uh, scholars have looked at how different types of parents parent. Um, and uh, like what that means is like, what are the different practices that different kinds of people use in order to raise their kids? And the work of Annette Leroux uh, in a classic book called Unequal Childhoods um, explored how some parents engaged in concerted cultivation and other parents engaged in what she called natural growth. Concerted cultivation is a way of raising a child that, rep, uh, uh, that emphasizes talent and educational development through organized activities such as sports, music, and language classes, and very close engagement with their children's school experience. So, this means that you have a concerted effort to cultivate your child. Natural growth, by contrast, is a childcare approach that gives children more free time and parental, ex um, uh, and parental expectations are ones where pa their parents generally trust institutions like schools to foster academic and career success for one child. And what Leroux argued in this book is that both are valid and have merit. So concerted cultivation, um, which you can think of as helicopter parenting as well in, in work, um, uh, con more uh, contemporary work, one where parents are sort of hovering over and constantly making concerted efforts to cultivate their children. 
Um, both are, have merit, but middle-class approach, which is concerted cultivation, yields educational and occupational rewards that build over the child's lifetime. That is, the uh, advantages accrue and accrue and accrue. In other words, Leroux argues that middle-class parents and upper-middle-class parents are much more likely to engage in concerted cultivation, and working-class parents are more likely to engage in natural growth. And that both are legitimate. Part of the reasons why middle, middle class and upper middle class parents are engaged in concerted cultivation is that they typically have higher educational degrees and can help facilitate or build upon what institutions like schools are doing versus working class parents who have less educational attainment typically rely more on educational institutions because they recognize the value of those institutions as having a set of things that the parents themselves don't have to as high of a degree, but that these different modes of parenting can produce future inequalities. And the point here is to think about how different parenting styles, which are conditional by social class, may lead to a cumulative advantage for some children um, uh, as opposed to others. Um, uh, uh, finally, uh, well, not finally, actually, there's a few more themes I want to talk about. Um, we should look to intimate partner violence as something that happens within relationships. And earlier in, in one of the lectures in this section, I talked about how relationships aren't a panacea or aren't like this perfect thing that are going to fix all of the problems. And um, uh, one of the problems of relationships is violence. And violence is very common within relationships. So violence is not that common as a random act. Violence is very common within relationships and sometimes within relationships that have been terminated. So women are frequently the victims of violence of male partners, either former male partners or current male partners. And so we should ask how and why it is that relationships facilitate or produce violence. And the four main types of violence are physical violence, sexual violence, stalking, and psychological violence. The CDC the, um, uh, defines uh, physical violence, sexual violence, stalking, and psychological aggression um, as the main forms of intimate partner violence. And these should be thought of as a public health issue, um, which, which is to say it's not just a problem of individual pathology of men but instead a result of the ways our institutions work and are built. Physical violence is the intentional use of physical force. Sexual violence involves sex without the other person's consent or agreement. Stalking is a pattern of repeated unwanted attention and contact. And psychological aggression includes communicating with a person um, with the purpose of harming them or controlling them. And this includes, contemporarily, we sort of have this increasing attention to gaslighting, which is a form of psychological manipulation in which the victim is lied to with the intent that they question their own sanity or their own recognition of reality. And you know, the, the experience of intimate partner violence has long-term harms, psychological harms, physical harms, sometimes resulting in death, um, uh, uh, labor market outcomes, um, and mental health consequences. And so, you know, social policies that seek uh, to produce relationships in order to reduce other social ills, so say marriage promotion as a social policy, need to recognize that if we seek to, to promote partnerships, we also need to do things or take steps to reduce violence from within those partnerships. Um, Finally, divorce and remarriage are increasingly common, although divorce is sort of declining a little bit, um, when compared to the 1960s. And so, um, uh, um, while divorce is sometimes seen as an indicator of a social problem, some scholars like Rudder have argued that unhappy marriages that result in divorce can benefit the emotional health of both parties. So we shouldn't think of divorce as necessarily bad. Instead, 
we might think about divorce as potentially benefiting the emotional health of partners who are in unhappy marriages. We also see that remarriage is on the rise. More and more people are getting married for the second and third time. Remarriage is on the rise um, uh, uh, in part because like, as more people get divorced, the likelihood that people then get remarried is higher. Um, so, um, uh, and one of the patterns that we see within remarriage is that um, uh, most men and women marry within five years of being divorced. And this is especially true for uh, those over 55, but remarriage happens uh, when it does happen um, uh, quite quickly after marriage. And this isn't because just, or just because, but it isn't um, driven by the fact that marriage is dissolved because one person has found another partner and is cheating and then leaves the partner and they quickly remarry the new person. It's because people organize their lives around marriage and households. And as they organize their lives around those marriages and households, um, when they lose it, they lose their patterns of living. So it's not just about the person that they're married to, it's about the way that they live and the consequence of, um, uh, of that. Now, I wanna end with a discussion of the future of families. And so to ask what are the areas of social change that will affect families the most and what do the future fa of families look like? And um, there are four major areas of change for um, the future of families. Economic, demographic, sociocultural, and technological. Economic change is the idea that inequalities become entrenched. And, you know, we might ask how work hours, the cost of college tuition, healthcare costs, um, uh, 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 the increase in healthcare costs, and the fall of real wages are going to affect families. So if you know people are working either longer or shorter hours, depending upon where they are in the income distribution, as college tuition um, rises, as healthcare costs increase, and as real wages fall for people, what will that mean for families? Some of that means that there's pressures on families to stay together because of the sort of hedging that families can allow uh, for, for people. So by gathering together a range of resources, you protect yourself from economic shocks. But it can also mean that economic shocks create a high degree of stress for people and that the stress that it creates aggravates the experience of the family. The demographic changes that are of interest is how immigration will affect American families. For example, in the past, most immigrants in the United States came from Latin America, Mexico, and Europe. But now, they're more likely to come from Africa and Asia. And these demographic changes affect family structure and composition, in part because immigrants bring their cultural practices with them. So how is it that family structure changes in light of this? What about families of undocumented immigrants? For example, what happens to children when their parents are deported? For sociocultural changes, one of the most obvious uh, things that we can point to here is marriage equality or same-sex marriage. Um, and this has been a massive, massive social transformation over the last 20 years, not just in the United States, but in many countries around the world. This sociocultural change is a significant change in um, the structure of the family insofar as you have same-sex uh, households uh, who are married. I will note that, um, that marriage equality is in some ways a conservative movement. Um, and by a conservative movement, I mean a movement to try and preserve marriage and the family structure among certain subsets of gays and lesbians and that other gays and lesbians are not at all interested. But nonetheless, it's a huge sociocultural change. And um, we might ask, what other changes are we likely to see in the future? Um, uh, uh, what are the other cultural transformations? Um, could it be that there are families where um, parents are not engaged in a sexual union? So is it possible to imagine families where two very good friends collect together 
and agree to raise children. Um, is it possible to return to what has been historically the most common form of partnership, like polygamy and um, uh, multi-person households? Finally, um, uh, 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 what kinds of technological changes? Um, we've seen in our discussion of apps, for example, um, a little bit of my skepticism about technological change, but advances in technology of allowing working conditions to become more flexible, giving relief to child and elder care conundrum, um, um, may transform uh, the conditions of the family. Although here, I'm speaking to you again, as I remind you from July of 2020, um, one of the very interesting things about technological change in the family has been the effect of COVID on gender relations, where parents of children are, are working from home. One of the consequences that we were beginning to see of this is the huge impact of this on particularly women where women who are doing the vast majority of taking care of children while parents work at home are experiencing economic and labor market consequences to this. So that if we take the idea of the second shift seriously about how women work a second shift at home and ask how some of the technological changes that have facilitated the continuation of work under COVID has aggravated the second shift in this time of COVID. That is, it's created an acceleration of the amount of work that women have had to do at home and at work, and that the at-home work has been so much more intense because of the requirement to take care of children during the day that women's labor market opportunities has been extremely, extremely constrained because of this or their labor market advancement. And we're beginning to see new results kind of coming out from a range of um, uh, uh, data analyses that sort of confirming this. I'll say that those findings are preliminary. And that suggests that the technological change of the capacity to work from home may not be liberating for all people. It could, in fact, have big impacts on gender wage gaps and women in particular. So there are many things for us to think about in terms of the future of the family relative to the changes in the economy, the changes in demographic conditions, sociocultural transformations, and technological change.